Welcome to The Nest Show, the podcast that brings you insights into the crypto market, trading and investment experiences, and what we're looking forward to as we navigate the space together. Before we get started with the show, I want to thank our friends and sponsors over at Prime XPT, where many of our listeners have already signed up to trade by visiting the burbnest.com slash Prime XPT. Prime XPT is the most powerful trading platform offering immediate access to over 30 assets. Users may trade cryptocurrencies, Forex, commodities, stock indices, and much more, all from a single Bitcoin settled account. Prime XPT gives experienced traders up to 100x leverage to multiply their capital while also providing users with multiple order types, low trading fees, and ultra high liquidity to equip them with a one of a kind trading experience. Registration does not require any user information. So visit the link below and start trading on Prime XBT in minutes. And now for the show. What the Nest Show is. This is a podcast brought to you by the Burb Nest community, an independent crypto and forex centered trading community built to sharpen each other in capturing opportunities in the markets while protecting capital along the way. What this is not trading advice. We are not financial advisors, and you should not regard any information here or in the Nest Club as financial advice. You should always consult a licensed financial advisor before making any financial decisions. Welcome, everybody, to today's episode of the Nest Show. And today, I'm truly honored to actually be hosting two of amazing, amazing traders. Uh, And these are very special and unique traders because they trade in a completely different market than most of you actually are aware of. And this is all about the Pokemon. And uh, it's my honor to introduce to you today, Jake, the Crypto King, and Nico Z. How's it going, guys? How are you guys doing? What's up, man? How are you, Burb? Very good, very good. Jake, mm-hmm. Every- all good? Yes. Everything is great. Thank you. And with the Pokemon markets, with crypto being down a little bit right now, it is unreal. Yeah, actually, you know, down, you know, down and up past couple of weeks, you know, Bitcoin has just been going kind of like sideways into sideways movement. But what I can know for sure is that Pokemon has not been going for the sideways movement for sure, for damn sure. It's been actually a rocking. And, uh, you know, you guys have really become a big, big people in the space of the Pokemon investing in it, investment, uh, investing in Pokemon. And, uh, I personally, you know, have always been a huge fan of Pokemon. You know, when I was a kid, uh, all of them 27, uh, when I was a kid, you know, I was actually crazy mad about Pokemon. I was always the very first person, you know, just on the block to have like this Game Boy Advance, you know, just to, with the cartridges to, to have and play or all, all of the, you know, just past editions like blue, yellow with the Pikachu and so on. So it's actually, so much nostalgia when I just, you know, speak out of this word Pokemon. So I'm so excited to have you here today, guys. And my very first question, if you don't mind, uh, firstly to Jake and then to Nico, is, is Pokemon hot back again? And if the, yes, then what actually made it happen hot again? Like, how did it all start for you guys? So, yes, I believe Pokemon is hot again. I believe all assets run in cycles, but I believe different assets have underlying factors that drive value. Supply and demand being the most basic from Econ 101. Pokemon is a very unique asset, being there's such a limited supply of high-end cards. So if there's only two or 300 of a specific item, and that's stagnant, that doesn't change. It's two or 300 from now until forever. These cards were, came out 25 years ago. So if we've got supply stagnant and demand increasing over time, what happens to price? It goes parabolic. And so right now, what you have is people noticing that, wait, there's only a couple hundred of these. We're never going to be able to get them again. They're nostalgic from our childhood. And our price is exploding. And so as more and more people are having that nostalgia and coming into money as the kids that we were, and I'm 30, you're 27, my buddy's basically 30, Nakozi. And so we're all coming into money. And as we're doing it, the things we want aren't Picasso paintings. They're nostalgic Pokemon cards. And so lots of things are driving the markets. But yes, Pokemon is hot again. Long story short. That's very good to hear, you know, and I couldn't agree more on my end. I just want to also hear, you know, what Nika has to say on that. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with what uh, Jake was saying there. Um, I think that 
for the first time ever, especially when it comes to Pokemon, um, you're getting a cross-generational sort of uh, come together, right? Pokemon is special because unlike, you know, traditional fine art where, you know, you will have the older generation really looking at it, this time around you're having now the largest media franchise in history. It's, it's now the largest media franchise. It's bigger than Star Wars, bigger than Harry Potter, bigger than Hello Kitty even. And you're having it grow go across generations. So you're not only having guys like us who got into it when we were young, but you're also having the younger generation who are who are, you know, watching the show daily still, who, you know, are buying cards, the new generational cards. So even though there are different cards, you're having that cross connection. And I think that that's what makes Pokemon so special, unlike um unlike a lot of these other card games, unlike a lot of these other collectibles. Okay, and how about Dragon Ball, for example, cards? I used to have like so many Dragon Ball cards. Why is it not so really hot anymore, like like Pokemon? Go ahead, Jake. It's nostalgia. Nostalgia drives value of almost anything. If you think about it, I never traded Dragon Ball Z cards in the school ground play like when I was a kid. And so there's a lot of different cards. There's Harry Potter cards. There's Dragon Ball Z cards. I mean, the list is endless. They try to put cards with everything. That doesn't mean there's value with everything. There's a million different painters, but people want Monet. They want Picasso. So just like how there's different, there's a hundred different types of cars. There's a hundred different types of painters. You have to know the specific thing you're looking for. And in this case, it's Pokemon. And within Pokemon, there's even more niche markets that are for the extreme collectors. And so it's not everything that's collectible. It's only specific things. And in this case, it's Pokemon. Yeah, I got it. You know, I got to tell you, uh, there's, we've just started this show and there's already a couple of good, you know, just thick statements given to the people, especially, you know, with regards to what drives the value uh, for, for the Pokemon cards. And you're saying that it's mainly the nostalgia, you know, and the sentiment as we wish to call that. And, uh, but like long story short, but how it all started truly for you, Jake and Nico. Jake, by all means, how'd you get into this? So it's actually a very funny story. Um, obviously, we're in COVID right now, or the tail end of COVID. Well, four months ago was the beginning of COVID, and I couldn't have been more bored. I was traveling for crypto before that for about two years, speaking at conferences, doing my trading. And then I was locked in an apartment for four months with nothing to do. So what did I decide to do? Pivot some crypto wealth into Pokemon cards. And I started collecting some Pokemon cards. And then I realized that people were offering me much higher prices than what I paid like two weeks prior. And I'm like, if I'm making 20, 30% on a card and I'm holding it for less than two, three weeks time, do I really care about the cardboard? And of course I had the nostalgic factor, but I'm a trader at heart. I was going from crypto to Pokemon. So 20, 30% gains guaranteed week after week. I was like, this can't be real. So I tried it. It worked. I sold my cards, made the 20%. Instead of cashing out and leaving the Pokemon space, I took the full amount I had, put it right back into Pokemon cards and rolled it again. Same thing happened, up 20 to 30% on everything. It was like, wow. It's like... That sounds like, a, sounds, like a nice, sounds like a nice Ponzi scheme. <laughs> Yes, but because they're cardboard and because they're so highly collectible, everyone wants them. By the time we get off, I bet you're going to be on eBay checking the price of Pokemon cards. And so mm-hmm. it's so much interest. And now everyone's got the nostalgic factor and the prices are skyrocketing. It's you have FOMO, you have nostalgia and all of that. So I got in just because I was, I was a nostalgic collector. And then I sold them because I was a trader and earned the profits. And now it's just been compounding on itself for five months time. Amazing. I mean, I I have a very s- similar story. Jake's actually the one who got me into Pokemon. Um, he actually hit me up and was pretty much like, "Hey, man, you know, this is actually a really good uh, flip little little side project that we can uh, uh, that you can do." Actually, at this point, we weren't even in business, and uh, you know, just like the hustler mentality that I am. For those of you that do follow me on Twitter, um, I was flipping shoes. I've been flipping a few other things um, for a long time now, so it made sense to me. Right now, I didn't know I didn't have the expertise to go through all these cards the way a lot of people are approaching uh, Pokemon now. Right. There's a lot of different um, numbers out there. There's a lot of different years, a lot of different types. And uh, Jake gave me pretty much a crash course. Um, 
I did a few of it, and I was already extremely successful just by you know buying into the cars that Jake told me to buy. And uh, you know, as things started progressing and Jake started making more and more sales, uh, we decided to make it into a business, and uh, that's essentially the primary business and how we kind of um, made it into reality. Whoa, that's some that's some good story. That's some good story <laughs> from both of you. Yeah, I can man. Tell, but. Yeah. So see, actually, you know, COVID, you know, it, it, for, for some people it's the end of the world, but for the others who actually can make and make and use the opportunity that comes from that, just like you did. So this opens up like a brand new world of, of, of opportunity. So huge well done of that, definitely. Uh, but, you know, I've always been kind of like wondering, uh, I mean, always, always since I actually um, realized this is such a big market, <laughs> which is not so long ago. Uh, mainly because of, of what you guys are doing, you know, in, in, the, in the social media. So again, well, such such a good job on that. Um, and actually, it's becoming viral already. You know, I ru- I know your guys running it like your Instagrams, like your mm-hmm. TikToks. So it's really becoming really catching on fire. And uh, well, is it is it kind of like you too that has initiated like this huge snowball effect and made this market go viral? That's a yes and a no question. So before I came into the space in May, there were a lot of individuals in the space and it was a very small space. So like you said, you didn't realize how big the Pokemon space was. It wasn't so big. There were maybe maybe 50 big collectors. When I say big collectors, collectors with over 100,000, maybe a half a million dollars in Pokemon cards. I mean, 50 collectors in a space is a very small amount. I mean, think about there only being 50 crypto traders or 50 old car collectors. So we're talking a very small amount of high-end, high-yield individuals, high net worth collecting Pokemon cards. So I came into the space and realized the highest-end cards were significantly underpriced compared to sports cards, compared to other items that there are only 100 of in the entire world or 30 of in the entire world. And I realized if I start acquiring these items, they become exceptionally scarce. So the market started moving ex- very, very quickly, and we got to basically where we are today. Yeah, yeah Nico, how about it? I mean, uh, exactly that, right? So, you know, it, I think that uh, I think that obviously, you know, we have influence um, when it comes to certain markets. I well, I guess just having, you know, for example, for me, right, I have twenty five thousand or twenty six thousand on, on Twitter. That already, you know, puts somewhat eyes on the an already small market as it is um but i honestly think that regardless of whether i came into the space or even jake coming into the space i think that pokemon would have already been here it just would have taken maybe a little bit longer because gary v was already talking about pokemon like when uh, you've recently seen a video with Jake being, you know, uh, at Logan Paul's podcast. Jake was essentially was at Logan Paul's podcast. He was kicking it with Logan, and uh, that shows that he was already looking. Um, guys like Gary V were already talking to him about Pokemon beforehand, uh, which shows that um, I think the space would have expanded. It just would have taken a little bit longer uh, to expand, but I have no doubt that it would have already gone to this point. Um, if not trailed back just a little bit. A little bit off of what Z was saying. Um, did we have an influence on how quickly the space built? Yes. It would have organically grown more slowly. But in the last three months, because of who I am in crypto and who have the investors I've brought into the space, like Logan Paul, for example. Logan Paul didn't own Pokemon cards before I sold them to him. Mm-hmm. Yes, with Gary Vee. And yes, he's heard about Pokemon cards. But in his video, literally, he messaged me on Instagram. I woke up to 10 messages from Logan with a bunch of Pokemon cards circled. And he's like, hey, can I have these? And so we negotiated. <laughs> literally flew out to Logan's. We kicked it for the day. He did a full recording about basically me educating him on what's Shadowless, what's First Edition, what's Base. I mean, there's so many different deviations that 10x or completely diminish the value of the card. So I taught him all about that, and then he became fascinated. Well, he's a major collector. If he gets his friends fascinated, now you have a group of 10 or 20 major collectors that were now competing with 50. So now you have 80 in a pod that was originally 50, so now the space has doubled almost overnight. And so what, what's the snowball effect of that? Logan's one of the top influencers in the world. Everyone will copy what Logan does. So when you have 20, 30 million followers, all the smaller influencers with one, two, 10 million followers are going to copy you. 
So Logan's about to open a box on Friday. Once that box is opened, every influencer is going to want to get their hands on the box. Yep. Yep. In the world, maybe 50 maximum. We own one of those boxes, Neko and I, as our company. It's a company's box. But the price of the boxes, the price of the cards, as you bring more and more important people into the space, the snowball effect happens, and they, by default, bring other important people into the space. So now you have all these high-end individuals. Steve Aoki just bought a PSA 10 first edition Charizard for $170,000. It was on his Instagram yesterday. Whoa. (laughs) for individual pieces of cardboard that six months ago were like 50K. Yeah. So that's what's going on. You're having the snowball effect and only the big guys have gotten in. None of the smaller guys have yet. So as more smaller guys get in, the price is only going to go up as demand goes up because supply is stagnant. Super yep. simple. Yep. This is exactly like the hype beast sort of uh, situation, right? So like I'm very, very familiar with the hype beast scene, which is like, you know, Supreme, Cause, Nikes and so forth. I'm very, very familiar with this scene. And, um, you know, Off-White, um, you know, Anti-Social Social Club, these kind of brands really got large because key individuals started coming into it, right? Guys like Kanye, um, Steve Aoki coming in with Cause dolls and so forth. These At the end of the day, a Cause statue – it's cool. Definitely. Don't get me wrong. It's a cool statue, but it's nothing different than another statue. That's also really cool. The only difference is that Steve Aoki or these other guys decided to put their money towards these statues and it created that value. The same thing is happening with Pokemon. And the difference now is that Pokemon is so small and so maneuverable that, you know, people can travel with them. People can actually show them off. People can do dealings with them. That's what makes it so incredibly, you know, fascinating as well as, you know, incredibly desired by, by investors. Yeah, well, I got to tell you, like, this reminds me so much of cryptocurrencies. <laughs> For real. <laughs> yep. It's so similar. Like, crypto in and of itself can also be... Well, it is. It needs to be sort of like treated as the collectibles unless the regulations truly really allow to accept it as money, right? Which is a mm-hmm. rarity. Uh, so yeah, this still kind of like rings and corresponds with one another to a very close, you know, just this, uh, well, extent. But, you know, uh, you mentioned the lo- Paul Logan, of course. Uh, like, would you be able to spill, you know, just some, some more bills on that? I'm so actually interested to yeah, know, please, like, how did please, it look Jake. like? Uh, uh, Jake, yeah. you mean you have direct interaction with the guy? Um, Logan couldn't be more humble. He is, you see from his videos, a lot of people get a bad perception of him. He is the opposite of what you'd expect. He is the nicest, most humble guy. He literally let me speak for probably two hours of the two hours and 15 minutes we were there because only thing he said were questions. Tell me about Shadowless. Tell me about first edition. Why would you recommend this? Explain this. He's humble. He's curious. He's eager to learn. Everyone looks at him as he's this big, cocky influencer. It's not the case at all. He's a really down-to-earth guy. And almost every time I've come to LA since, we've done a Pokemon deal. We've done one of many different things. So most people's perception of Logan is completely off. And he's really excited about Pokemon cards, which is very funny because his only tattoo is a Squirtle. So like literally... I saw it. (laughs) And what I ran off to get earlier were two Pokemon cards. And the difference... This one has this little first edition stamp. This stamp okay. makes this card sixty-five to seventy thousand dollars right now. This card is a nine. It's the exact same card. It came out the exact same year. It has no stamp. Okay. Okay. It's two. So we're talking seventy thousand for a little stamp, or two thousand for out the stamp, and it's the same card in a nine. So when we talk about like supply and demand, there's a couple hundred of these. There's a couple thousand of these. So if you want the cream of the crop, you want the card that's sold out in 48 hours, then you're going to spend for this. If you want what makes you nostalgic, you're going to spend for this. And so each person, it's to his own. But someone like Logan, he wants this. So he bought a nine and immediately he went and got a 10 because he wants the 10. So some people collect all 10s. Some people collect all nines. There's a budget for everyone. If you don't have that much money, you can collect ungraded. It's tiered down based on how much you can afford. Okay, so uh, what's the difference between the 10 and the 9? Uh, like, is, is it just the stamp? The grade. So a 9 would be a 9 out of 10. So like getting a 90% or a 92%. A 10 is like 95% and higher. So 
on a 10, there is still damage most of the time. So you can usually see on a 10, like a little piece of damage. And on a nine, there's usually a little piece of damage too. So it's kind of funny that the price differential is so much between a nine and a 10, because I've seen tens that are worse than nines. And I've seen nines that are better than tens. So it's like, it's all greater perspective. And that greater perspective between nine and 10 makes a Charizard first edition go from 60,000, 65,000 to 170,000 was the last sale. So the nine and the 10, just the number on the label on a card that looks identical adds $110,000 to the cardboard. Jesus Christ. I mean, the prices you are just shouting to me are like so shocking (laughs) probably to most of the people on the planet right now. I mean, like who on earth grades it? Who decides that this is worth 60,000? I mean, not on the, like say, let's say demand side, but on the supply side. Who grades it? Like how does it look like? There are two grading companies, the two big ones, excuse there are three, SGC, PSA, and BGS. PSA and BGS are the two most popular by a long shot, and they don't apply prices. They just apply grades. So if they grade a card and 5,000 come in and only 100 get a grade of 10, now everyone wants a 10. People don't want a card that says a four on it. What's a four? That's not exciting to show off to your friends. You want to show them, hey, I've got a 10 out of 10. And so that excitement drives value. And so now they unintentionally created a side market that says, okay, a four is worth X and a 10 is worth X. They're not selling the side market. The demand decides it because as you can see, Logan bought a nine and then he decided, no, I need a 10. And so as people want tens, the price of tens get driven up. As people want nines because they can't afford tens, price of nines get driven up and so on and so forth. That's crazy. Nico, Nico, how like who, because... As far as I recall, uh, you guys are in some sort of like a partnership, right? Together. You're building a company. And who is in charge of what in in your kind of like... So I would say, uh, you know, Jake is his... No one can source cards better than Jake. It's just that's that's what I'm saying, right? So the alpha that people are searching for when it comes to Pokemon is your connections. And that's why, like, I have no problem talking about alpha on this business because, you know, everybody has their own alpha when it comes to trading, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, In this case, the alpha is Jake and his connections. And that's something that you cannot recreate. You cannot just, like, go to Logan Paul and be like, hey, I want to talk Pokemon with you. I want to be on your podcast. He'll laugh at you, right? Getting that right there is true alpha, and um, that's essentially what Jake has. So Jake is the primary guy when it comes to sourcing as well as actually selling a large quantity. Jake has been killing it. Um, what I provide is I provide an operation standpoint, like we're built, we're building on a few other projects around Pokemon, um, as well as cards, but at the same time, I also do sales myself. And then we have one other partner, his name is Luke. Um, and Luke is actually the guy who he's actually used to be an owner of coin market cap. And he's the one who got uh, the tattoo of CZ. I'm not sure you saw that post back in the day, uh, but CZ has a tattoo of a Binance logo on his arm. Luke also has a tattoo of a Binance logo on his arm. Um, he was one of uh, three people that got the tattoo that oh. day. And uh, <laughs> Luke is, it was, you know, instrumental in selling coin market cap to Binance. Um, so Luke also um, is involved and Luke came in with capital. He also is also a part of, you know, the buying and selling, um, but more on the capital side of things, because he's got a lot of other stuff happening. Um, so I think that's where the correspondence would say. I would say, you know, Jake is a CEO role. I'm coming as a COO, um, that kind of differential. Jesus Christ. I mean, guys, the more I hear from you, the more fucking shocked I am for real. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it's man, so, it's, it's, uh, so crazy. it's good. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you know what? I, w- I wouldn't be afraid to make a bet that in, in the matter of, I don't know, one or two months, like some Kanye West is going to drop you a DM to just come and visit him. Or if I could real. Yeah, dude, I've been, a. Uh, you know what? I've been uh, trying to make a bet with, no one has taken me on this deal so far, but I've been trying to make a bet that Pokemon will um, outperform BTC by the end of the year. I've been saying this since like two months ago and no one has had the balls to, to, to come at me with this bet. I told everybody I would take a one-to-one bet, no matter what the amount is up to, I mean, I, I'm not going to like bully somebody out, but like up to a hundred thousand, I'll do a one-to-one bet that Pokemon will outperform BTC by the end of the year year and no one has so far taken me to, on that offer um so yeah 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 i'm not going i'm not going to take this bet anyway because, <laughs> because i know you're right <laughs> yep. yeah um you know i just 
you know, again, because there, this is so much shocking to me that I actually, you know, I have thousands of questions, but I know, I know, uh, you know, you're kind of like, in, you know, just in between a lot of, you know, just flights and an overall mess because of, of the business that it generates so many opportunities. So, you know, I, I'm, like, I'm a huge fan of yours already. I'm sold, right? And uh, just the way you kind of like guys explain to Paul Logan, like, I would like to know for myself and for the audience, Like before, before I let you go, pretty much, um, what drives? Like, if you were to to kind of like put a list of check boxes, right? What needs to be checked? Checked? Like, what features you need to have? So, for for the car to let's say to make people spend two hundred thousand fucking dollars for that. So the check mark list depends on the person, because remember, one of the most driving factors is nostalgia. So for each person, their checkmark list is slightly different. For me, I'm looking for value, liquidity, and a couple other things. As far as a Pokemon card goes, that's a tiered approach. So first, you have to determine your budget. Once you've determined your budget, you decide, for me, it's only base. The 1999 base cards that I remember them coming out, the ones I opened the packs of, not Fossil, not Jungle, not Team Rocket, not all the ones that came out 20 years later, not the stuff from this year. The 1999 base is the only thing I work with because to me, that's the, that's the OG. That's the one that people will want forever. In Black Lotus, uh, excuse me, in Magic, the Black Lotus, the original one is what people wanted forever. So I'm applying the same concept to Pokemon. So for me, it's you want first edition, you want shadowless, you want base. Out of those three sets, what's the most important? The highest grades, eight, nines, and tens. So I want first edition, shadowless base, eight, nines, and tens. And beyond that, it's which cards. You don't want just random cards. You don't want energy cards. Those really aren't worth anything. I mean, you're not playing the game anymore. So what's a fire energy really going to do? So then it's you pick your cards. And you've not really messed with Pokemon in a while. What card do you remember? Oh, bro, I, I remember like a few hundreds of Pokemon <laughs> for real. Name that come to mind. Well, I love, I love Pikachu. I love Charizard. I love Mewtwo. So, Mew. Stop right there. Mm-hmm. The top two Pokemon in the entire space for collectability and demand are Charizard and Pikachu because of what you just said. I didn't prompt you on that question. You literally just picked two random cards. That's what every new collector recognizes instantly. And because of that, the demand for Charizards will forever be there because every new collector coming in, the first thing they want is, I want a Charizard. What's the best Charizard I can get for the money I have? And so they want a Charizard, and then they go to Pikachu or Blastoise. So Charizard, Pikachu, Blastoise, Venusaur, in the sets I mentioned, in the highest grades, you figured out how to invest in Pokemon yourself. You just ask yourself, what would you want as a new investor? You buy that and you wait for more new investors to come in. And that's exactly what they're looking for. So you literally just laid it out yourself. I got a, I got a feeling, but before I let you know, Nico come in on that, I got a feeling that I'm actually going to stay with you in, in DMs for some time <laughs> <laughs> to, to learn more because that like, it, it, it still kind of like barely reaches, you know, just to me for what's going on with this market. So that's so crazy. But uh, I got a question, you know, uh, one of the last questions for, for actually Nico, um, like what's the most expensive card and box you actually guys sold? So we, I mean, we, so recently, right, we purchased a, a first edition um, base box. So we actually got like the Holy Grail box, right? This is like the, the most expensive box you can essentially buy. It's the one that has the potential to pull a first edition Charizard and all these other cards. So we actually have one of those boxes. I posted it online um, and uh, immediately off the bat, right? We're already, I'm not going to say how much we bought it for, but immediately off the bat, we got, we have offers that are ranging 30% higher and plus like immediately like i mean they're talking about i mean if there you go jake's smiling right now because we even have offers right now above 50 percent right now apparently so um that's within like i'm talking within like three four days burb and you're talking about a you're talking about an asset that's you know well into the six figures you're not talking about an asset that's like that's like you know ten twenty thousand dollars you're talking about literally 100k plus um so and it's liquid it's like people are literally throwing money at us wanting to get the box um, so that, I guess, is something that we could say is the most expensive sell that we've done uh, because we have the offers available right now. It's just picking and choose what's the best option for us as a company and who to okay. sell it to, right? 
Okay. Yeah. So yeah, uh, the very last two short questions actually. Uh, that actually corresponds again very straightforward with, with what you just said. So um, where you actually buy or sell this? Almost all of it's private sales because to do a three hundred thousand dollar transaction, you don't really want to use an eBay or something like that and have a fifteen percent fee and all of that. So it's almost always private sales with high end collectors, which is why the network, your connections, make everything in the space. Because you have to know the buyers, the twenty, thirty buyers directly who would pay three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars cash or Bitcoin or bank wire for a specific item. And that group is very, very small. You can't just reach out to them. You have to already have an established relationship. And so that's why what I bring to the table is so important because I know who's selling those. And I know who's buying those. Putting it together is almost impossible. Knowing each group is almost impossible. So I've got that full circuit on lock, which is why I'm going to Orlando, Dallas, San Antonio, San Diego, and Los Angeles in 72 hours starting tomorrow. So that rotation is how you collect and how you sell, but the hustle is extreme. You've got to be able to commit. Uh, Nico, do you have some thoughts on that, perhaps? Like, no, that's uh, that's exactly what it is, right? That's that's the alpha, right there, guys. That is literally the alpha. I, I, you know, and and I I'm sorry that a lot of people are you know you know kind of butthurt about that because you can't really recreate the business. Now you can obviously still make some great profits buying and selling Pokemon on a smaller side and hustling for these you know you know, five, 10% flips. Absolutely. You can absolutely do that. And I encourage everybody who wants a hustler mentality to do that, because that's how you eventually build that relationship. But when it comes to um, getting the relationships that Jake has, the reason why he was able to do that is because for starters, when he entered into the market, he entered in with big positions. He shook up the market. Originally, uh, there were these, you know, a few collectors that were essentially um, controlling the market because they all were the ones that had big money and they were the ones buying and selling these large cards. Now, when Jake came in, Jake had capital already from crypto and these other uh, projects that he's done. And he just came in balls to the wall, threw capital at it, right? And he shook up the entire game. So that's where the alpha is. Now, if somebody wants to come in with like a million dollars, you know, and wants to kind of push into the Pokemon scene, by all means, you can probably get um, you can probably get some good relationships that way, but you know, it's also going to cost you a million dollars per se of risk. So you got to ask yourself, you know, are you willing to put that risk? Now, Jake just happened to do that risk four months ago. So, um, you know, he was able to get all that upside this last four months, you know, and, and, and his, uh, his risk was rewarded. So, you know, it really comes down to whether you have the balls to do it. It's the same exact thing that it's the same exact way when it comes to sneakers, as well as a lot of these hype beast um, situations. The guys who make the money are the guys who have insides at Nike, the guys who have insides at Adidas, the ones that can buy these shoes that cost $2,000 for, you know, retail, which is $199, um, you know. There you go. Every single shoe that they're selling is 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 a is a is a ten x. So, <laughs> so it's the same exact way when it comes to Pokemon. Um, so that's essentially the alpha. It's can you network well enough to get that to that level? Can you network well enough to have Steve Aoki? Can you network you know well enough to have Logan Paul DM you? If you can, then by all means do it, right? But it's not the easiest thing to do. Yeah, you need to you need to have some special. I would say. Well, skills, you know, and, and, and the knowledge and the insights, just as you said. So um, before actually, you know, the creator, is, is, the, uh, is the Pokemon creator actually alive still? The illustrator, the artist yeah. who did, yeah. I cannot pronounce his name. I'm going to completely mess it up because it's Japanese. But <laughs> the last, Arita, um, he is alive and he does a lot of autographs still. I actually have a card I just bought, one of the first edition nines I showed you, the card that's like 65, 70,000. I bought one of those signed by him. That's about to get here in the mail, which has like a, a little Charizard drawn on the front. So really cool card, but I'd show you now, but he's not here yet. Wow. So uh, before, before, you know, they actually hire you, uh, you know, to, to be the, <laughs> to, over, to overtake the company, the Pokemon company, um, you know, I want, to, I want you guys to know that what you've been doing is so impressive. It's so shocking, not only to me, but also for many people. And, uh, and it seems that you actually created and at least, you know, put a huge chunk of the market uh, to exist. So I think, you know, that's, that's super, super interesting, you know, to have been talking to you about uh, how it all kind of like shaped. 
And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, these guys, Jake, uh, Jake the Crypto King and Nico Z uh, mm. have just been our guests. And uh, do you guys perhaps some final, final thoughts to share and leave our audience with? Jake, please. Yeah. Don't be scared to hustle. A, if you can enter with $500, $1,000, I might not be the guy selling you the cards, but eBay has a million cards. If you stick to the basics, base set, Shadowless, first edition, the big three in any grade you can afford, you can get into the space and earn your 20, 30, 40%. Remember, the prices spike at Christmas. So the next three months is the best time to have the cojones to jump in with however much you can afford. I'm not saying max out your credit card debts, that credit cards. That's what I did. I made a killing. That was a great choice looking back. Could have been a really bad choice. Whatever you can afford, take the risk, jump in before Christmas, acquire what you like, and enjoy the role. Don't be hesitant. Timid, hesitancy, that never makes any money. So take a risk right before Christmas. Time to do it. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, you know, I, I'll just reference a, a quick point. You know, yesterday I had a good talk with uh, Trader Main. For those of you that know Maine, I'm sure, Burb, you know, obviously know Maine. Um, so, yeah, it's good to talk with Maine about this. And it's funny because a lot of people look at crypto and they're like, oh, you know, I'd rather keep my money into crypto and whatnot. But in reality, crypto is, if, if anything, is more of a risky asset class than, than uh, you know, the most popular media franchise out there. Pokemon has 25 years. It has, you know, mainstream adoption and, and following is, and, you know, fan base. Um same with shoes and, and these other and these other asset classes. People, I think, in crypto Twitter get so focused on crypto and that's the only thing to trade that they don't realize that there's so much money to be made in elsewhere, other markets. And um, you know, if you have a good opportunity, definitely try to go follow it. Um, you know, like Jake said, right? You don't have to come in with you know fifty thousand dollars. You can come in with five hundred thousand dollars. Like like Jake said, we might not be able to people to we might not be the guys to sell you those cards. But there's many options out there, and you can start your hustle then. Oh, that's been that's been some really good good thoughts. And uh, my only comment is, uh, guys, to all the audience, to all the listeners, uh, what I think you can do best is you can go to the Twitter and type in at JB the Crypto King and make it a follow, and as well as Nico Z per at Crypto Nico Z, uh, and there is no way that you leave this episode uh, with not giving them these guys a follow. I mean, I'm a huge fan already, guys. I'm so, so much appreciate you coming to the show. Uh, that's been quite a nice, right? And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll make sure, I'll make sure to stay in your DM. Yeah, so, no, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Months. This has yeah. been an absolute blast. Awesome. I appreciate awesome. your time, guys. Thank you for having me on and definitely let me know. I'll get you some cards. Mm-hmm. We'll make sure to talk. Uh, that's been the Nestor guys and uh, my, my today's guests were the initiators of the Pokemon market, as you, as you wish. Uh, best of luck, guys, and see you on the next one. The new crypto platform offers a comprehensive suite of crypto trading tools, indicators, educational programs, and earning opportunities to help you become a more profitable trader. Visit theburbness.com slash newscrypto to get started. I'd like to thank our listeners for joining this episode of The Nestro. If you've appreciated the depth and breadth of what you've heard with us today, subscribe to our podcast and find our landing page at theburbnest.com. We have a vibrant Discord community which acts as our central hub of operations, and we welcome you to join us at theburbnest.com slash discord. We also offer an extensive free bulletin on emerging crypto market trends, exclusive undervalued gem reports, and in-depth expert technical and fundamental analysis at theburbnest.com slash bulletin. We always appreciate engagement from our community, which of course means liking the video and subscribing to our page, where we insist on bringing you the highest quality content available. Also, we're happy to incorporate tips and topics from our listeners and encourage you to email us at thenestro at theburbnest.com. This podcast is brought to you by The Burb Nest. Thank you and trade on.